Hi everyone and welcome to uh, our 10th panel, I think, of uh, the Electoral Integrity Project Conference. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, this session is on electoral contestation, uh, actors, levels and dynamics. Um, and I'm Sonali Campion. Uh, I'm a doctoral researcher at the University of East Anglia. So um, we know that a critical aspect of democratic election is the extent to which they allow for meaningful competition. But in both electoral autocracies and countries experiencing democratic backsliding, it is this space for contestation that is being increasingly constrained. Can all citizens run for office in practice? Uh, can get, they get their message across to prospective voters? And do candidates whose messages and policies um, have broad appeal to have a realistic chance of being elected? So our presentations today will grapple with some of these key challenges to uh, electoral contestation um, from executive aggrand aggrandizement uh, and abuse of incumbency to political finance and voter information. So we'll give each of our speakers uh, a maximum of 15 minutes um, and I'll send you each message uh, two minutes before your time's up uh, to keep us on track and ensure that we have uh, time for the Q&A at the end. Um, so those of you uh, in the audience, um, please feel free to post questions uh, in the chat at any time um, and we'll also have the opportunity uh, to speak on camera um, in the Q&A at the end. Um, so our first speaker um, is Adam Schmeisky, uh, Associate Professor at the University of Warsaw who is going to discuss the limits of equal electoral contestation uh, at subnational le levels with reference to Poland. Thank you. All right, I hope you see uh, my screen. Um, right, I actually, uh, uh, I will start right from uh, the, the first slide I, I had. So uh, I would like to say that uh, this presentation is uh, actually or reflects uh, or reveals part of a project uh, that I'm doing at the University of Warsaw, uh, uh, which is a kind of pilot project um, on five out of 16 provinces in Poland. And it covers also selected cities from these provinces. And it is about three for legislative periods of local government uh, in Poland, so from 2000, uh, from 2010 to 2024, because the last local elections were in April uh, 2024. Um, and uh, one of the aspects that uh, is covered by this project is uh, the, the problem of competitiveness uh, or equal contestation when it comes to, uh, to subnational elections. Just one uh, um, issue of explanation when it comes to uh, um, territorial uh, division uh, in Poland and uh, elections related to, uh, to this. So we have in Poland uh, three um, levels uh, when it comes to territorial uh, uh, tiers, uh, level of municipality, uh, also cities and villages, uh, level of districts and level of prov provinces. And when it comes to elections, direct elections uh, uh, both to the councils, so let's say legislative bodies and uh, direct elections of head of executives uh, take place just uh, at the level of municipalities, uh, cities and, and villages, but not at the level of districts and provinces where just councils, so these legislative bodies are directly uh, elected. The questions that I pose uh, uh, in this paper, uh, which are of course also part of this project, uh, uh, are can smaller parties, local electoral committees, and independent candidates, uh, but also social urban uh, movements compete on equal foot with large parties. The second question uh, I pose is if we can observe this um, excessive use of incumbents advantage by, um, on the one hand, uh, local politicians, but also on the other hand, uh, politicians at the national level that support uh, their colleagues at the, at the local level. The third question is if there is uh, some kind of difference between uh, when it comes to the problems or level of competitiveness uh, between large, medium-sized and small cities and uh, or municipalities. Uh, and the, the fourth question is 
what are the reasons for for some limitations that uh, that we observe uh, in Poland when it comes to equal electoral contestation? Uh, and this is some, of course something that I will uh, um, uh, tell you about uh, in a few minutes. When it comes to theoretical framework, uh, just for for this small part of our project. Uh, 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 I use here uh, this typology of electoral malpractices by Sarah Birch when it comes to the descriptive part of uh, of a paper, uh, assuming also that um, uh, the limitations of electoral equal electoral contestation are related to uh, uh, to two uh, of three um, types of electoral malpractices uh, mentioned by Sarah Birch, which is manipulation of electoral law and manipulation of the vote choice. Uh, when it comes to analytical section, it is uh, some elements of historical institutionalism and rational choice theory uh, uh, are used, first of all. Uh, when it comes to methodology, this uh, qualitative uh, um, research, uh, uh, and, uh, first of all, because of a lack of uh, sufficient detailed uh, data so far when it comes to subnational uh, leveling uh, uh, in Poland, when it comes to elections, but also, uh, but also, uh, uh, there's also other problems with, um, when it comes to democratic backsliding. It does, of course, it does not concern only Poland, but my case is Poland, so I'm, I'm mentioning Poland. So uh, uh, when it comes to uh, data uh, sources, uh, they're coming from uh, two focus group interviews uh, we did uh, with journalists and local journalists and NGOs. Uh, also, it is based on um, uh, analysis of local uh, media. Uh, um, uh, and then on uh, 32 in the semic structure interviews we did with, first of all with local authorities, also with some experts. Uh, plus we did also, this is the last issue we, we have just uh, uh, done, uh, uh, we did it in June 2024, so just one month ago. Uh, uh, we ordered actually a kind of a national omnis, uh, omnibus survey, uh, national um, uh, uh, in our, to put it in another way, uh, we ordered two questions which uh, were part of a national omnibus survey uh, done by one of uh, the biggest Polish uh, public opinion uh, uh, company. And when it comes to methods of analyzing data, and this is actually still work in progress, um, that's why I didn't prepare a paper and just a detailed presentation because we are at the early stage of analyzing the data. Uh, but uh, it, it will be what is content analysis uh, and process tracing, uh, uh, first of all. Uh, and now, uh, 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 why we, uh, we, we have chosen, uh, and I have chosen also this uh, topic, we see quite clearly when it comes to the literature, there's a problem with a kind of comprehensive approach to this uh, um, problem of competitiveness of elections or equal electoral contestation. Uh, there are just single uh, studies uh, concerning some aspects uh, like non problem of non-competitive elections in many municipalities or just uh, generally the problem of incumbency advantage of competitiveness in, uh, in general terms. Uh, and uh, on the one hand, we see when, when, when because uh, what I will tell you about this problems with uh, equal electoral contestation is based on, uh, first of all, on all of the, all of this uh, interviews. So from this uh, respondent, uh, um, uh, from uh, when it comes to opinions of respondents, we see quite clearly that both when it comes to local authorities, but also, as you will see in a second, uh, when it comes to citizens, inhabitants, they have generally a positive opinion towards uh, um, uh, elections and electoral integrity in a sense that uh, uh, they assess this positively. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, this, uh, uh, um, open, one of the questions we ordered uh, with a uh, national uh, survey that was actually carried out uh, last, uh, last uh, month, uh, we see one of the questions was uh, about um, uh, actually, if people feel that they have uh, influence on decision-making process through elections and referendum. And we see quite, quite clearly that quite a lot of people uh, 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 see this influence. So actually, we, we assess positively uh, uh, elections, uh, as a, uh, local elections, uh, as a kind of uh, democratic institution. But when we look at uh, um, the question, uh, the questions that I posed at the beginning, and when we ask about this uh, the question of uh, equal electoral contestation, what we see that when it comes to subnational elections in Poland, 
there are many problems. Uh, uh, in case when it comes to um, electoral law, uh, uh, of with problems with equal electoral contestation concerning um, electoral uh, 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 law, it concerns first of all cities, both small, medium, but also large cities. Uh, and when it comes to uh, vote choice issues, so I'm referring here to this Birch uh, typology. Uh, actually, it, uh, so the problem of incumbency advantage, first of all, it concerns all levels. So uh, cities, uh, no matter what is the size of a city and provinces. And now uh, some, uh, you know, some highlights when it comes to uh, uh, to this uh, problems with uh, equal electoral contestation in subnational elections. Uh, first issue, uh, I mean, the first issue is related uh, um, um, to the fact that electoral uh, law in Poland, when it comes to local uh, and regional elections, uh, gives uh, actually uh, advantage to uh, big political parties or parties generally in comparison to, to urban movements, uh, social movements and, uh, and so on. So it is, uh, uh, I will not read, of course, this uh, uh, quotations here, we don't have time for this, but um, it is first of all about such issues as uh, um, the number of seats in uh, constituencies that give advantage to, uh, to big parties, or it is about limitations uh, when it comes to city movements if they take part in uh, as, as local committees uh, in elections, because uh, they uh, uh, have some limits when it comes to, uh, uh, to financing. Uh, it, this is related to uh, uh, with the issue of elections, uh, with electoral law. Uh, another issue that actually it was it it it, uh, it was changed in 2018, but until 2018 it was so uh, that uh, uh, there was no limit when it comes to a uh, uh, number of legislative periods uh, within which. Uh, particular people can uh, take office, hold offices, and you have on the right the picture of one of uh, major of one of uh, small cities in Mazowian province in Poland, that uh, uh, he has been the major since, since 2019, uh, sorry, uh, 19, uh, 1990, so uh, he, uh, he has been a major for a really long time. Uh, and it uh, actually uh, contributes to the situation that they build a kind of small, less, I would say, uh, kingdoms or empires with uh, uh, with uh, a lot of resources to their disposal, and there is no chance for other candidates to uh, to compete on equal foot with uh, with them. Uh, this is electoral law, but also there are there are um, uh, problems when it comes to uh, uh, incumbency advantage. On the one hand, it concerns uh, local and regional authorities themselves, so they. Uh, use uh, uh, public money, uh, media, uh, local media, uh, local businessmen uh, and uh, their offices uh, for their advantage. Uh, and I think a very good uh, um, uh, summar uh, summary of uh, uh, opinions when it comes to this incubus advantage uh, was presented by one of journalists uh, uh, saying that we have created the system of uh, uncompetitive uh, uh, that in principle uh, uh, we, we have created the system so uncompetitive that in principle the chances of anyone overthrowing the incumbent are really slim. And this is due to the fact that the government has been running an electoral campaign for four years, mainly for public money, and when it comes to the elections it is a clash between David and Goliath. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, this uh, problem of incumbent advantage, on the other hand, uh, of course, uh, for example, urban movements, you see on the right here, one of the urban, urban movements in Poland, they don't have sufficient money to compete with, uh, with, uh, with this, uh, uh, um, um, leaders uh, of local committees that, uh, that actually have different resources to their disposal. Moreover, what, is, what comes out for, uh, from uh, our interviews is that uh, local politicians do not see something wrong with this using of incumbency advantage, but they treat it as something uh, that it is uh, completely acceptable. Um, but I would like also to underline that when uh, when it comes to ca case of Poland, uh, we uh, we see that uh, very often uh, uh, people uh, um, from the governing party support uh, their local colleagues again with the use of public money. 
um, uh, with, uh, with visits of ministers, for example, during the election campaign to support local candidates. So this is this national level that plays a role also, uh, also here. Uh, and of course, when it comes to the question, what are the reasons uh, uh, for this, both this uh, problems with uh, um, equal um, um, uh, uh, competition um, uh, with reference to, to electoral law and uh, this vote choice, referring again to Sarah's Birch uh, typology, uh, I think uh, we can observe here, of course, this is, we are analyzing this now, but so this is a kind of pre preliminary observation. But this is, there was a kind of process, uh, uh, um, particularly after the um, introduction of direct elections of uh, heads of executives in, at in municipality level, we observe a gradual consolidation uh, of power resources of uh, these local leaders uh, uh, when it comes to small and medium towns. And uh, the same uh, concerns political parties and their leaders when it comes to big cities and provinces. And it leads to the situation that on the one hand, there's uh, uh, very, uh, very often no change of electoral law uh, and it's still favorable for strong local committees and the big parties. Although there are some changes like 2018, the change concerning uh, the number of uh, legislative periods uh, um, this is something that I mentioned, and there is still this use of incumbent advantage, and this is something that is actually acceptable by by local or regional authorities because uh, it is in accordance with their political and economic interests. But this is also something acceptable by the people because they uh, they have many benefits uh, from the incumbents, uh, um, uh, particularly shortly before before the elections. Uh, all right. Just one and minute to wrap up. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Preliminary con conclusions now. Uh, uh, so, what we observe in Poland, of course, this is based now on just preliminary observations. We are uh, this is a work in progress, and we are uh, analyzing this all of this data. We, we have a large set of uh, sets of data, but generally speaking, what we can observe on uh, at the beginning of this uh, uh, analysis, we see that uh, there are many limitations when it comes to equal electoral contestation in subnational elections in Poland. Uh, this is related to, uh, uh, I mean, uh, first of all, local leaders or big political parties are privileged, uh, and this is related to electoral law or incumbency advantage, first of all. Sometimes, uh, when it comes to some uh, issues, these limitations are bigger or were bigger uh, uh, than uh, at the national level. For example, there is this problem of non-competitiveness in small towns. So there is just one candidate. There is no other candidate taking part in elections when it comes to the office of a major. Uh, um, uh, then, uh, when it comes to limitations of this process of consolidation, uh, um, uh, when it comes to the uh, limitations uh, concerning equal electoral contestation, uh, behind this is this process, uh, as I mentioned, of consolidation of power and resources, the kind of gradual process uh, conditioned uh, both by local politics, uh, but also influenced by national uh, party politics. Uh, and uh, the favorable condition for this uh, um, um, lack of equal electoral contestation uh, are created by acceptance, uh, both on the sides of uh, local regional authorities and, and citizens, inhabitants themselves, which of course reveals the problem in, in Poland when it comes to, to democratic uh, political culture uh, at the subnational level. Thank you very much, that's all. Brilliant, thank you so much, Adam. Um, that was a really fascinating kind of breakdown of some of these questions that we often see asked at national level. Um, but they having those dynamics at subnational le level are really interesting. Um, so we're going to turn next to uh, Bernard Tamas and Alicia Archer uh, from Valdosta State University, and they'll be discussing electoral bias and democratic backsliding in Hungary, Turkey and India. So over to you. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Give me a moment, please. I assume everybody can see the presentation now, um, full screen. All right. 
All right. Uh, thank you very much. I'm I'm um, Bernard Thomas from uh, uh, Valdosta State University, and I'm working with on this project with with uh, Alyssa Archer. And and as said, it is about electoral bias, kind of taking a concept that is now commonly used in uh, electoral study research in terms of things like gerrymandering and so on and connecting it directly to issues of, of democracy and democratic uh, backsliding. So it's the taking these two areas and kind of pulling them together. So I'm gonna start with talking about giving, we all know this framework, but just as giving us, putting us as a starting point to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, Lipharts framework that is so famous and is becoming more relevant now uh, that, the idea, again, is Liphart's main point that he spent his career talking about mostly is about the, the difference between the majoritarian and consensus democracies. And where for him, the great threat with majoritarian systems, and again, I'll focus on majoritarian electoral systems, uh, and he's speak, speaking specifically about single member districts, uh, systems in which there's a tendency for a single winner and kind of a con uh, single winner that what happens is for him, this produces leads to increased polarization uh, and kind of a zero sum conflict. So in other words, when you're running a system the way that the, the US does or the UK does, for example, you are more likely to produce the kinds of conflicts that actually lead to, to democratic backsliding. So, and great framework, uh, but we are taking, Alyssa and I are taking this from a, a different angle. And this different angle is instead to look at the question of simply concentration of power. In other words, not looking at it as, does the system produce conflict that could lead to uh, democratic backsliding, but instead come with the specific starting question of, or you know, observation that that the greatest threat to democracy is authoritarians taking charge and having enough power that they're capable of dismantling the electoral system. We can take this very basic concept, trace it back a long way in political theory, certainly probably most famously with James Madison's framework, the idea of factions, and we include political parties as factions, factions, any faction gaining too much power is dangerous, period. Doesn't matter which one. Uh, anytime, and the whole idea of some sort of a distribution of power so that nobody is has too much control and as going on too much administrative control, the more current literature uh, focuses on executive aggrandizement. The idea that if you have any, uh, when you have somebody, some individual winds up as the, the head of government and that person has uh, authoritarian uh, ambitions and the backing of a party to do it, that that becomes a threat if the system doesn't have enough guardrails, if it doesn't have ways of stopping that in the courts and, and within the administrative state and so on. So this is looking at it from a different angle. What the electoral bias issue comes in, at least in the way that we are using the term, is that electoral bias increases the probability of um, a party that doesn't have a majority of support winding up gaining a majority or even supermajority control over the, the national legislature and, and potentially that level of control over the government. Right now, again, if, if the party is committed to democratic state, they're not a threat, but if they happen to be ones that have uh, those types of ambitions, authoritarian ambitions, then that is the point when the state comes into trouble. Now, in terms of looking at this, it's, you know, current, um, 
current political situations actually produce examples of what we're talking about. Thankfully, not in terms of just in terms of framework, thankfully not in terms of back, backsliding in these cases, but we've just had two elections in, in France and the UK. And in France, the French system is, is heavily biased. And the tendency is for um, uh, the for some party who wins does well in the first round could get thirty percent of the vote could easily gain control over the um, over the government at least the legislative branch. This did not happen in this situation, but we're now in a situation where national uh, you know the national rally is rising. And where we came desperately close to them actually gaining significant levels of power. Again, it isn't that the French system, the French system has been majoritarian for decades. And that hasn't led to necessarily until recently the rise of this level of, of a problem. But currently, this is now a danger. The UK, we look at Labour having won this big election and it's like, woo, Labour won. Uh, change. Labor won with somewhere in the 30% support and ha get a, had a smashing victory uh, in Parliament. But what you also have now is the Conservative Party potentially moving to the right and and in a in a dangerous direction and still being the second potentially the second strongest party. This is every chance that that the Conservative Party could wind up you know, in a future election, being much farther to the right and still winding up gaining power. Again, this doesn't happen uh, right now at this point, but this is what the framework says. The UK has had a majoritarian system for many decades, uh, easily over a century. And it, we now is the point where where the danger is is really showing itself. So this is kind of where we're going with this. So to talk, let me first talk a little bit about electoral bias. I mean, there's a lot of pieces we're putting together here. Uh, electoral bias, there's a long literature on this, uh, always with the looking at the relationship between percent votes and percent seats. Uh, the most famous framework is from Gelman and King, is partisan symmetry and the whole idea of them is it's something called the vote seat uh, curve and the idea that that a system, as long as it's fair to both parties, is fine. Well, if you get, you know, 30 percent of the vote and 50 percent of the seats, it's fair as if it would have worked the other way around, which is why this system is used for gerrymandering, because gerrymandering tilts towards one party. And so this is often what is being used today. And while this is a great measure and has many uses, um, what the problem with it is, is it kind of ignores another issue that I think is far more important than we think so, is that, Alyssa and I, is that that if you have a system where a party is winning in the 30, 40 percent range and then winning 50 percent, 60 percent of the seats, you're increasing the probability of a centralizing of power within a single group of people. And, and that centralization of power, again, is, is what is one of the factors that could lead towards um, democratic backsliding. So, and here's another issue, and this is looking, without going into too much detail, we can look at this as a self-reinforcing system. When political parties gain seats, they gain other resources. It helps them regain power. The system, systems like this, we would argue are not self-corrective. Quite the opposite, concentration of power leads to further concentration of power, often. And so what you have is, in other words, what we've taken as nice systems in the past, we're arguing can be quite dangerous. Uh, but we're also, so what we're happening is while partisan symmetry is one way of looking at electoral bias, um, we're looking at another one without going into the math, uh, referred to as asymmetrical disproportionality. And that's what happens when a party gains a higher percentage of seats than its votes in comparison to other parties. And this is the whole uh, asymmetrical disproportionality is one of those things that, yes, it can hurt representation. You can have a group of people supported by the public, a party, and wind up with virtually no seats, it's not particularly fair 
to the voters. But the other thing that is even larger is it increases the possibility of a party being catapulted into power or centralizing of power. And we would argue that it is not just majoritarian systems that can do this. And in terms of the three countries, I'm only going to talk about the, the first two and only kind of in, in, you know, generally overview terms. But the three that we're looking at are India, which is a majoritarian system. It has a first past the post system. But we're also talking about Hungary, which is a mixed member. I, we have written majoritarian. It's supposed to be a mixed member proportional system, but it doesn't really didn't really work that well. Um, but you also had Turkey, uh, which is a proportional representation system, but it has a very high minimum threshold and so has a tendency to push nonetheless uh, under certain circumstances, centralized power to single groups. So just briefly in terms of what we're talking about, this is the uh, levels of electoral bias uh, uh, of, in the Hungarian system going back to after the, the fall of the Berlin Wall. And what you can see, if you're looking at it on the left side, here is the first two elections. There is a ridiculously high level of, of electoral bias of promoting whatever was the, the top party. So a top party in Hungary could do, and it had kind of this weird, you know, it has a proportional side and it has these single member districts that they copied from the French. So it looks like the French system uh, uh, in, in certain ways. And what happened in the Hungarian case, at least in the beginning, was the single member districts wind up having produced huge levels of, of, of bias, promoting, you know, and without going into the parties, the sp some specific parties at the time. And then you can see that, so here it is, the, the system wound up having, uh, being less biased as time went on for a number of years. So here we come in the, around 2008, you have your economic crisis and a couple of other factors that were more, more specific at the time. And suddenly you get this massive electoral bias again. And this number up here, this is Viktor Orban's party right here. This is what turned Viktor Orban into the uh, person who had done, who kind of the, the authoritarian of, of, of Central Europe, our classic case of this. The, the bias was so great in the single member districts that, that they won, Fidesz had won something like 98% of them at this election with just over 50% of the vote turned out to be enough to rewrite the constitution and and basically undermine the system, the democratic system. Uh, again, if it wasn't for the electoral bias in the system, Orban would have been prime minister for a few years and that would have been basically it. This is uh, our graph. This one is uh, India and this one a little bit simpler, but here is why this is important. India also very, very high level of electoral bias. If we're looking here at this early period, uh, this is when the, the, um, the uh, Congress, the Indian National Congress was in charge. And this period right here was the emergency where, where the uh, prime uh, minister basically decided that uh, needed a rule of law executive order and you suddenly had a short period of, of, of collapse of, of Indian democracy without going into details. But again, a lot of it wound up being a concentration of power. Uh, then you saw the system kind of calmed down, kind of worked. Here we see now, this doesn't include the most recent election, but you see this rise again of electoral bias. You know, this is the BJP and this is Modi. And here we see this point, again, a concentration of power. So it wasn't so much, again, it was the, the polarization that was being caused. At least this is not what we see. What we're seeing is a system where there's a, a um, moments where a party gains far more seats than what its actual public support was, 
putting it into a better position of uh, dismantling the system. So just now as a conclusion, what this tells us as a practical matter in terms of, of, of promoting democracies, what it says is that the steps involved, one of them is electoral reforms that reduce electoral bias. And that often means eliminating pure majoritarian systems, but it's not the only issue. If it causes electoral bias, it's a good ticking time clock. I mean, it really is a situation where, oops, the wrong party wound up in charge, and then the system is scrambling in order to try to, to, to hold together. What it also means is steps of you want to keep keep from individuals gaining too much party uh, power within any political party, right? Because that's part of it. First step of authoritarian is gaining control over the party. You know, uh, Donald Trump, I'm looking at you. You know, this is part of where the issue is. Um, and then again, we're talking about regular then guardrails for trying to keep it so if a group gains power to make it as hard as possible for them to dismantle the system. So this is the basic framework that we're working on. And uh, thank you very much. Now I'll stop here. Thank you. Um, that was a, a really interesting angle on, on this discussion of backsliding. And I think it, it highlights this really important thing. Um, as you said, the UK election, uh, it was a very relatively small share in the end, um, that got a huge majority, and and we've seen that a lot recently. So, really important discussion. Thank you. Um, so next up, we have uh, Shelley Mahajan uh, from the Association of Democratic Reforms uh, to talk about political funding regulation in India. Um, so, go ahead, Shelley. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Let me just um, um, So thank you so much for having me here. Uh, I work with the Association for Democratic Reforms with their political parties division, where we analyze the funding and expenditure data of political parties in India. Uh, my presentation today is going to be focusing on campaign finance regulations and the overall political funding landscape uh, and its performance across various indicators of electoral integrity. First, a few uh, quick facts about India and the recent elections, which concluded a month ago. Uh, we have the first past the post uh, system. Uh, there are 969 million electors in India, and we have a multi party democracy with six national and 60 state parties. We have more than 2,700 smaller unrecognized political parties. On the perception of electoral integrity index, India scored 55, which makes it a closed democracy. Uh, in this year's general elections, there was a total voter turnout of 642 million. There was close to 65% uh, turnout of female voters. In about 19 states, uh, there was more uh, female voter turnout as uh, compared to male voter turnout. However, this did translate into increasing representation of women in the parliament. Currently, we have only 14% women MPs. Uh, there is not a single minority MP in the winning coalition, which has about 293 members of the total 543 members in the parliament. The estimated cost of elections, according to a Center for Media Studies report, has been around uh, 135,000 million Indian rupees. Uh, I'll also give a brief overview of the political finance framework in India. Uh, there are various acts and regulations that regulate political financing, most important being the Representation of People Act. Uh, in terms of the sources of funding, till about February this year, anonymous funds were allowed. Uh, they were introduced first time in 2017, but uh, as a result of a petition filed by ADR six years ago, the Supreme Court of India uh, scrapped the electoral bond scheme, which also introduced unlimited corporate donations. So uh, we are back to the pre-2017 system now. However, the government has given indications that they are in the process of bringing another law on similar lines in the future. Uh, so right now we do, uh, foreign uh, donations are prohibited. Uh, there are both direct and indirect corporate donations. Uh, there's also a limit on corporate donations of about 7.5%. Uh, we don't have any direct provision for that uh, public or state funding at the moment. Uh, there's also a regular reporting of political finances by political parties uh, to the Election Commission of India. And most of these, uh, you know, they're uh, readily available in the public domain through the website of the Election Commission. 
in terms of the spending limits, there are no uh, spending limits on the expenditure by political parties, but there is a limit on candidates' expenditure, both for parliamentary and state elections. Uh, in terms of the regulations and guidelines for third party expenditure, though they exist on paper, but they're not very robust. And from time to time, the Election Commission faces the challenges of monitoring and tracking expenditure by third party uh, party expenditure pages on social media and otherwise. So moving on, I'm going to be uh, talking about political finance in the realm of electoral integrity, and we'll be looking at wide ranging data, uh, which will give you an idea as to how we're performing in terms of these six indicators that I've borrowed from the website of Electoral Integrity Project. Uh, looking at the first indicator, which is contestation, whether there is, uh, you know, possibility for wide range of groups, individuals and parties to be able to contest elections. So for this, we uh, analyzed the data of more than 8,338 candidates, which contested elections in the general elections this year. About 20% of these candidates had criminal cases. 14% uh, had serious criminal cases. These are cases which include uh, cases related to rape, murder, attempt to murder, crimes against women, and kidnapping. 31% of these candidates are millionaires, which means that they have assets of 10 million and above. 90% of the total candidates were uh, male and 10% were female. There were two candidates from the third gender. Now, when we analyze this data and we try to understand what role does money and muscle power play in Indian elections, what we find is that they are uh, they very strongly determine the electoral fortunes of the candidates. This is uh, true for both female candidates and male candidates. For example, if you look at uh, candidates who, who are wealthy and are millionaires uh, in terms of the definition that I've given, the chances of winning of such candidates is 19%. However, those male candidates who are not as wealthy and have wealth less than 10 million Indian rupees, their chance of winning is only 0.6%. In terms of female candidates, again, uh, chances of winning for a millionaire female candidate is 25% against 1.49% uh, for someone who's not from a wealthy background. So clearly, these act as an entry barrier uh, because anyone who's uh, you know trying to contest election without muscle power or does not come with access to uh, you know enormous amount of funds may not uh, be likely to win an election in India at this point in time. Uh, in terms of the current composition of the Indian Parliament, so we have five forty three MPs. Forty six percent of these MPs have criminal cases. Thirty one percent have serious criminal cases and about 93% of them are millionaires. Uh, we have about 74 uh, female parliamentarians, which makes it about 14%. 43 MPs have cases related to hate speech against them. 15 MPs have cases of crimes against women, and 27 MPs have cases of attempt to murder. So not only are there entry barriers to contesting elections, but when we look at a composition of a parliament like this, it's clearly there are repercussions for the quality of governance that it is going to del deliver and the kind of policy making that is going to happen. Another very important observation that uh, we made during these elections was that uh, there was a lot of pressure tactics and intimidation was used by the incumbent party uh, to basically, uh, you know, uh, pressurize the opposition candidates or independent candidates to withdraw uh, from the electoral frame. And most, uh, you know, acute was, I mean, there are some, there are several seats where these examples were there, but most important being the Varanasi constituency. This is the constituency from which Prime Minister Narendra Modi contests elections. And this year, uh, 33 nominations were rejected. In 2014, when he uh, contested elections for the first time for the parliamentary elections, there were uh, a total of 42 candidates contesting elections. But this year, there were only seven candidates competing against him. Uh, this is also true of the constituency of the Home Minister of India, which is Amit Shah. Uh, from his constituency, Gandhi Nagar, at the very last minute, 16 opposition candidates, they dropped out. So uh, many different constituencies reported these kind of instances where at the very last minute, independent candidates or the opposition party candidates had to withdraw. Uh, and one can clearly say that the electoral uh, competition was not as healthy as it was supposed to be. Coming to the campaign finance, uh, we, for this, we look at the data of national parties in the last two decades. Uh, first is the data between 2004 and 2014, which is when the Indian National Congress was in power. 
uh, and then we analyze this data between the last, I mean, between 2014 and 2023, which is when the incumbent, the BJP party is in power. So in both the cases, we can clearly see that the party in power has disproportionate access to funds. But what has changed recently is that the gap between these parties in terms of their access is only widening. Uh, in the previous decade, when the Congress had a share of 45% and BJP at 31%, right now the BJP has a total share of 66% and the Congress is at 18%. Uh, moving on to the direct corporate donations. So in India, there is a provision for both direct corporate donations and indirect uh, corporate donations. When we look at the data for direct corporate donations, what we see is that uh, between 2013 and 2023, uh, the BJP has a share of 83% of the total donations coming from the corporates, which is followed by the Indian National Congress at 12%. And for rest of the parties, the situation is quite dismal. Most of this funding is coming from sectors such as manufacturing, mining, real estate or construction, which are heavily regulated sectors. Uh, which, which makes it very clear that, you know, because the state is involved and many of these companies are donating funds from these sectors means that they expect some sort of quick back or ease of uh, restrictions uh, from the incumbent party. When we look at donations from electoral trusts, so electoral trusts are something which were first time introduced by the Indian National Congress in 2013. Now, what happens here is that companies donate money to the trust and then it is uh, distributed to parties through an inter internal criteria, which is not available in the public domain. And even through these trusts, a disproportionate amount of funding is going to the BJP, which is more than 70%. And not only that, uh, there are 26 registered electoral trusts, but uh, one trust, which is a prudent electoral trust, uh, has raised about uh, 272 million US dollars since 2013. And it is making more than 90% of its funds again, is going to the coffers of the BJP. So not only this concentration of economic power in the hands of few companies, which are uh, donating money to the political parties, but this also shows that there's a concentration of political power uh, in the handful of parties, and most importantly, the incumbent party, which is the BJP. Again, in this chart, you can clearly see that since 2018, uh, all different sorts of sources of funding, uh, the BJP has the largest share. It, in, it is in way ahead than all other uh, national and state parties. Coming to electoral bonds, something that took back our political finance system way back in time. When they were introduced in 2017, they were anonymous. Uh, they also uh, permitted unlimited corporate donations and they infringed on the citizens' right to information as any funds coming through these bonds need not be disclosed by the parties or the companies in their annual reports. So through these bonds also we could see that uh, they promoted, like they helped in making the level thing feel quite skewed because 54% of these bonds went to the BJP. And the remaining 20 parties, even if we add up the funds that those 20 parties have received from the bonds, it would not exceed the amount that has gone to the BJP. Another very problem situation with electoral bonds was that uh, with the Supreme Court's decision uh, this year, uh, the data, when it became public, we could analyze and see that several thousand companies donated to political parties in India. And most of these companies donated after being graded or after receiving income tax notices. Many of them were loss-making companies and some of them donated uh, funds which were several times more than their profit. Uh, in the last few years, what we've also seen after analyzing the data from various sources of funding is that electoral bonds became the most popular means of political contribution. And the funds coming from this source was way ahead than all other sources of funding put together. Uh, on your screen, you can see some of the examples. Once we started analyzing the data uh, about the companies that started coming into uh, that, that, that basically donating through electoral bonds, these are some of the investigative reports that the media did. Uh, it was called the Project Electoral Bond, and they found out that several uh, pharmaceutical companies which donated uh, electoral bonds were several million. They failed drug quality tests, and it is only after they donated money to, uh, you know, the parties that they were able to get a clean chit. Uh, there are several instances like this, and uh, even Delhi's chief minister who was in jail, uh, he was given an interim bail today, but uh, he was implicated in this case by someone who donated electoral bonds to the BJP and someone who was accused in the liquor uh, case and later became an approver or a witness against the Delhi's chief minister because he donated like total bonds. So there's all that money trail is available in the public domain. Coming to uh, the core idea, which is about representation. 
when we analyze it, uh, the funds that have come through electoral bonds in terms of their denomination, what do we see is that, uh, so there are electoral bonds were available in denomination of 1,010 million, but 94% of these were purchased in the 10 million denomination. 96% uh, of the donors who made funds to electoral bonds were companies and business houses, and only 3% were individual donors, which clearly dilutes the principle of one person, one vote, and clearly shows that there was undue influence of big donors, uh, you know, on political parties. Coming to the quantum of unknown sources of donation, again, with the electoral bonds, this has increased over the years. And there's also contributions as far as to, uh, any contribution, which is below rupees 20,000, is also need not be disclosed by political parties. So when we add up all these different sources of funds, we see that uh, the incumbent party has the maximum amount of funding coming from unknown sources of donations, which uh, of course has implications for disclosure requirements and also does not help voters making an informed choice when they don't know where the source of funding of the political parties is coming from. Uh, the last indicator where we talk about the transparent and fair usage of campaign finance, what we see in the recent election was a huge amount of money was spent by political parties in bribing voters. A lot of this was in terms of cash, liquor and narcotics to the tune of uh, 1,063 million US dollars. And this figure is only midway through the elections. We still don't have the complete figure. Uh, and this was several uh, times more than what was recorded in the previous 2019 general elections. Uh, lastly, I'm just going to be focusing on the social media expenditure because we don't have other forms of data related to other expenditure in the public domain right now. But as we have seen that the funding side is skewed in favor of a certain party, we also see that the BJP is in complete lead when it comes to having robust digital campaigning. And when we look at the top spenders of uh, political advertisements on Meta, what we see is that the highest uh, you know, money has been spent by the proxy pages which promoted content in favor of the BJP. Now, the problem with this is that these are shadow accounts which promote divisive content, they do propaganda posts, but since they're not directly linked with the candidate or the political party, and that link is also kind of hidden, cannot be established, they're easily able to escape the political finance regulations. Whatever money is being spent by such third-party pages, it cannot be added to the account of the candidates or the parties. Uh, Just a it, minute to wrap up, thanks. Yes, thank you. Uh, so yes, in terms of conclusion, all the instances that I've spoken about clearly, you know, violate the principles of electoral integrity and the impact this is going to have is the lack of trust in institutional framework, which we have also seen substantiated by many pre-poll surveys. Uh, Pre-2019, uh, the extent of trust that voters had in the Election Commission of India was at 51%, but this year, the survey shows that it has nosed dive to 28%. Uh, which will eventually have implications on the voter turnout as well. There are many recommendations which have been proposed by several committee reports. However, they haven't seen the light of the day because of the lack of political will. But I think uh, it's very important moving forward that whatever regulations that are framed in terms of political finance meet the requirement for the basic tenets of electoral integrity. And some of them I've just listed in my presentation. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for exceeding my time. Thank you, Shirley. Uh, that was such an important presentation. And I mean, the uh, amount of data that you've collected um, across those different indicators is, is fascinating. And I think um, it really, uh, the whole um, discussion of electoral bonds, the, the fact that it's been revealed um, who was donating and uh, on what occasions, that's really a highlight of the importance of transparency in this area. Um, but I think you also, I mean, your presentation touches on the challenge of diversity, um, which I think actually goes beyond political financing. But um, yeah, the, the, how I'm representative of, of India's diversity, the people, uh, the people who have been elected are. So thank you very much for that. Um, so we're turning to our uh, last presentation. Uh, so we have Octavia Kusama Sari um, of the Pelopor Philippa uh, 17 Foundation uh, and Rafli Rikin from Universitas Indonesia, who will discuss the use of voting advice applications in this year's Indian Indonesian elections. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the time. Do you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Let me record it on the that ship. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good night, everybody. Um, good evening from Jakarta, Indonesia. I'm Okta. I'm a research fellow at Pelopor Gerham 17 or um, PP17 uh, 
17, uh, 17 I mean. and together with my research partner. Uh, hello everyone, good evening from Jakarta. I'm Rafi Rikin, a uh, research fellow as well from Wapar Pilihan 17 and I am a student from Universitas Indonesia. Okay. Um, actually, we are deeply honored to be here today because um, we have gained valuable insight from uh, the researchers before us that already present to this conference. And it's truly privileged and nice for us to have this opportunity to share our research story about um, coding and task applications in backend Indonesia. And today we are, as a practitioner, actually we are researchers, but we are more practical. Um, we are excited to present our research on the impact of the first voting advice applications in Indonesia, especially on the political knowledge, voting choices, and vote considerations. Okay, before that, I would like to give you um, a short introduction about our foundations. Um, for now, 2024, there are only one voting advice applications in Indonesia that called Kaula 17 or the false or of seven links. And the VAA is empowered by our organizations and our organizations is dedicated to empowering young people, and especially for helping them understand their political preference better. So that's why our presentation says cheerful and colorful because yeah, we really um concerned about the youth. And then um Okay, so this is what we do in our website. We can we track the political party stances every three months. And before we start explaining about the impact of the voting advice application itself, I would like to give you a little background about Indonesian democracy. Uh, as this as a background, as you might see in the screen, Indonesia is a huge country with two hundred and seventy five point five million in it. That's a lot, right? And every five years, we held um, elections, nationals and local elections. Uh, we fought for presidential, legislative, governor, and mayor, which is under the legislative part, we have to choose um, national and local level. With the principle of one man, one foot, it is important to make sure that uh, every decision that we made is actually um, right and valuable so my my voice his voice and everybody's voice in indonesia are important so and we also have a lot of political parties that you see in the screen is only 18 that are eligible to participate in the last elections which is in february this year and yeah besides that challenge that's a challenge because we have a huge country and we have to distribute the the ballots and the this to the every provinces in Indonesia, we also still have a challenge about the low awareness and trust in politic, political parties. And second, we still um, challenge about the political landscape in Indonesia, often unclear and distinct ideologies and stances. This, especially for the political parties and the candidates, so this makes voters difficult to decide. And the third one is the youth engagement of uh, in politics as particularly low. As many young people in Indonesia perceive politics, either boring or taboo. So these challenges as worsened by the system, traditional system of election in Indonesia. We we still use the traditional system with this, which is with paper with a huge ballot. we we will got five this ballot as you see in the screen this big right and we have to choose the candidate and the political party in each ballot you can imagine how overwhelmed we are every five years so beside of that we also still challenge the money politics yeah it's my affect the uh, people choices at the end okay and then so it's become a question for us as a practitioner, as we are working in foundations. Is this a truly democracy or this is the ideal condition for Indonesia as a democracy, democracy country? So our conclusion is not yet. So we try to make the place of the coding of applications that we are the first window that 
putting advice application itself is already common in European country. So these tools are the attempt to inform user about the political parties or candidate and their standpoint to help voters make decisions based on these programs or these visions and missions rather than uh, money or politics or just random or just uh, identity of the candidate. So we try to make uh, informed choices for the people. Because we are an um, independent organizations, we are nonpartisan also, we tailor this voting advice application based on the vision and mission documents, and we analyze uh, the different program on the same topics. And so we allow voters or people to compare and understand the diverse perspective available from the candidates. Mm -hmm. And yeah, as you can see, we have two kind of voting advice applications. The one is the political parties, and the second one is the candidate that we use for presidential selections. And the political parties we use for the legislative. And yeah, we actually established and start in 2022. And now in this election, since 2024, we've got 1.3 million before the elections in less than two weeks. So we're proud of it, but it's still a long way to go because as you remember, Indonesia country still has a lot of people that yeah, 1.3 million is good, but we still to work more on this. So I think uh, it's enough. It's my friends uh, start to explaining about the impact of the voting advice application itself. Okay, thank you, Okta, for sharing the inspiring journey of our PTBLAS. It is truly remarkable to see how our organization has grown and impacted so many people. Now let's delve into how our voting advice application has made a difference in 2024 in relation presidential election. As supporters, I assume all of us participating here have been voting at least once in our life. We play a crucial role in shaping our future country. But sometimes we felt overwhelmed by the sheer amount of information during the election season. Imagine having a tool that cuts through the noise and helps uh, you to make an informed decision about your vote. That's precisely what voting advice application or PAA aims to do. In many parts of the world, PAA has transformed how voters engage with political information. Today, I'll be discussing the significant uh, impact of the PAA on your recent voters during our recent 2024 president election, focusing on three key areas, political knowledge, voting choices, and vote consideration. The 2024 Indonesian presidential election was a pivotal event with more than 204 million potential voters. 23% uh, of it was uh, generational Z voters. There was uh, three candidates pair uh, competing, Anis Mohaimin, Prabowo Gibran, and Ganjar Mahfud. As we can see from this slide, Prabowo Gibran won with 59% of the vote. This election was marked by extensive campaign and debates, which also meant to gain the favor of the young voters. It resulted in an overwhelming amount of political information for voters to process. Hence, it's interesting to see the impact of PAA on, in, on voters in Indonesia. To assess the impact of Kaulat Jubas PAA, we conduct a panel study with 384 respondents divided into treatment and control groups. The treatment group used the PAA while the control group did not. And we measured three key variables, both knowledge, voting choices, and vote uh, consideration. Uh, surveys were, uh, were administered before and after the election to capture change in these variables. Our, stati our statistical analysis focused on comparing the pre- and post-election response of the two groups. Let's dive into the first key area, political knowledge. Our study found that using the PAA significantly increased political knowledge among voters. As you can see on the screen, users of the uh, PAA showed an impressive 11% uh, increase in their political knowledge compared to non-users. This finding also aligned with uh, research from other countries where PAA have been shown to enhance user understanding of political issues and candidate platform. Now, moving on to voting choices. Here's where it's really uh, interesting. 
The VA also had a substantial impact on how voters made their choices. Users were more likely to rethink their vote based on the recommendation provided by the VA. As we can see at the uh, slide, we expect the VA to make users rethink and reconsider the choices. And the result uh, show it. In the control group, vote for Anis went down and vote for Ganjar went up. But on the other hand, VAA increased votes for Prabowo and Anis while decreasing votes for Ganjar. VAA makes user carefully consider their choices through a thorough deliberation process. And finally, let's talk about the uh, vote consideration here. Another crucial impact of the VAA was on how voters considered various issues. Uh, as we can see, VA users showed a little bit increase in rational consideration, while control group experience decreased. Uh, this finding highlighting the VA ability to help users maintain rational consideration, unlike the control group, which showed decreased uh, rationality as the election approach. The finding from our study indicate the VAA have significant potential to enhance democratic uh, participation in Indonesia by increasing political knowledge, informing voting choices, and encouraging issue-based voting, VAA can help voters uh, make more informed decisions. This is especially important in a context where voters are bombarded with a vast amount of political information. The success of Kaula 17 VAA demonstrates the visibility and benefits of independent VAA in Indonesia. Moving forward, further development and promotion of VAA could play a crucial role in threatening democratic engagement and promoting informed decision-making among voters. Additionally, tailoring PAA to address uh, the specific needs and concerns of different demographic groups could further enhance their effectiveness. Now, uh, looking ahead, Kaul 17 is gearing up for the even more ambitious project. Uh, we are currently working on PAA for the simultaneous regional election, which will cover over 20 provinces out of 38 provinces across Indonesia. And our goal is to reach more than uh, 10 million users, providing them with a personalized voting advice and helping them to make informed decisions based on the issues that matter most to them. This expansion is a testament to our commitment to enhancing uh, democratic engagement and ensuring that every voter has access to reliable and relevant political information. Uh, you can find uh, our website at kaula17.id and our social media down below. And I think that's it from uh, us. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you so much. Thank you. And it was brilliant to end with a presentation that offers a, a really practical perspective on, on how we can um, basically have a positive impact on the electoral contest contestation space. Um, so we're now going to turn to our discussant, um, uh, who is Clement Desremo from uh, the University of Lyon, um, and I will hand the stage over uh, around 15 minutes as well uh, to make his comments on, on the, each of the presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, well, I'm quite honored to, uh, to lead the, the discussion with you, uh, with you today. Uh, first, thank you very much for these fascinating and rich presentations. Uh, uh, thank you also for your for your papers, even if I received some of them a little bit late, I have to admit, but all of them were very interesting, uh, well documented, and echo current political and scientific uh, issues. So thank you very much. Um, so today the panel is entitled Electoral Contestation Actors, Levels and Dynamics. And it is difficult to draw common points between your different papers. One concerns political competition at the subnational level. The second is about voting systems. The third is about reform related to electoral system. And the last one is about voting advice application. But I tried. So I'm going to start with two points uh, of general discussion and question for all the contributors, and then I will go on with a uh, more precise question. Um, first, I would just say as a general comment that uh, in your various texts, in your various papers, 
there is a set of electoral conditions which are considered as normal between uh, between quotation marks or that you uh, that you uh, you find normal that is to say a fair competition equal representativeness of parties i turnout but which are in your papers not necessarily presented and truly explained uh, so i think you could present them more directly in order to give us a better understanding of the meaning of some of the points you made. My second general point of discussion concerns law. Um, of course, this question uh, is inspired by the title of our panel and by the fact that uh, most of, of you uh, make reference to, uh, to electoral laws. And indeed, national and international uh, legal frameworks could be of greater assistance to you in characterizing uh, your arguments. Your papers uh, take us on a journey from Poland uh, to Hungary, uh, India, Indonesia, and were very interesting from a comparative perspective, I have to say. But I must say as well that Sometimes <laughs> I got a little lost on the presentation of your cases. And the law is useful, I think, to simply say who are the authorized people, who are the authorized actor, uh, what practices are prohibited. And it could be very helpful for uh, the reader uh, and for the audience to have just in mind some basic element like that. And moreover, the law is useful as well to explore the complexity of principles such as fairness, such as equal representation and their translation uh, into practices. And I'm thinking, for instance, of legal qualification of uh, electoral malpractices uh, in the first paper. Uh, it could be helpful to just say what is authorized or not by, 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 by law in Poland, for instance. And the law is also a tool, a tool used and mobilized, and mobilized sorry, uh, by parties in power, by outsiders, and by observers to challenge practices. So it is also a good entry point uh, to understand the action of the actual thought. Just uh, a general thought. Then uh, I would like, if I if I may, in the second part of uh, of my discussion, to focus more on uh, every single paper and by the order of apparition in a, in, in a way. So Adam, first, uh, thank you very much for, for your paper. Your paper, I think, is very useful uh, to enter into the detail of subnational uh, competition. And I think that the qualitative approach with interviews of local authorities uh, is very promising. My first question concerns uh, the electoral contestation because I would like to give you the opportunity to give us uh, your own definition of the concept and uh, uh, to explain in which way you use it, especially regarding uh, the different actors you are interviewing, uh, as you said, journalists, NGOs, member, local authorities, uh, voters, I guess. And some of them are engaged in the political, within the political situation, are political competitors, uh, or are engaged in the electoral organization. Some of them are not. So maybe uh, you could uh, maybe explain uh, the, 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 um, well, why so uh, much different uh, people in your interviews. My second question uh, concerns uh, electoral disputes. Is there any formal uh, complaints from outsiders at the subnational level? I mean, I guess outsider may uh, use the courts to change the results, to change even more than the results, uh, to change the electoral law. And do you take them into account in terms of uh, competition and contestation in the subnational level? Let's turn to uh, Bernard and Alisa, Bernard and Alisa's paper. Of course, uh, well, it's interesting for me. I have to confess that the political situation in France, you explained quite well, raises my interest uh, to read your, your, your document. And in this regard, I must say that one of the specificities of the last French parliamentary election was for the first time, the fact that um, uh, the right-wing party worrying, was worrying uh, the far right. And from a historical point of view, authoritarian regime were rather set up 
and a proportional electoral system with a coalition, with a coalition between the conservative and the far right. So I think it is an important point to have in mind to discuss Lefart's assumptions. I would like to share with you some uh, thoughts about you, your text, uh, just to maybe to, to improve some, some elements. Uh, but of course, uh, I, 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 I think that your, your paper is, is probably can be published uh, without many, many, many change. But first, it seems to me that the beginning of your paper discusses asymmetrical disproportion, then authoritarian ambition of leaders, and finally, executive aggrandizement, as you aggrandizement, sorry, as you presented in the in um, well, a few minutes ago, and the transition between these notions is sometimes a little confusing. So uh, that I no, no longer really knew what the art the art of the uh, article was. Then I think to come up with the idea that in democracy one person equals one vote, uh, I think that. In your theoretical discussion, uh, you should, it should be enriched, I think, by a discussion, a discussion sorry, of concept of democracy, that is to say deliberative democracy, representative democracy, procedural democracy. And above all, uh, as you have India as uh, in your different cases, um, I think that, well, as India is a country that I speak under the control of the audience, of course, um, uh, uh, India as a social system in which, in which uh, 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 hierarchy matters, it will be necessary, I think, to add a discussion about pilarized democracy. Because I think I'm thinking of Belgium, of course, but there is uh, uh, different societies divided in two or more uh, groups known as pillars and based on religion or nationality. Uh, and in that case, uh, there is different discussion about uh, equality of representation, or the, the discussion is based on different grounds. And as you have India compared to Hungary and then Turkey, it could be interesting to have in mind what is the social representation of equality in the different system. And finally, I was wondering if you have the intention to take into account the narratives the narratives around the results, because you take the asymmetry between uh, votes and seats as a fact, but particularly in populist and uh, reactionary rhetorics, it is a way of interpreting the results and asserting a verdict, an interpretation, and a criticism of the system. So I think a social construction of interpretation is interesting as well. And finally, one point, what do you think about party construction? Because in the different graphs you presented, you can also read the building up and the consolidation of different political parties, the ramification of different political parties that could explain the BIs. Chile, Chile sorry, uh, you presented a paper about electoral law and uh, electoral reform in India. More precisely, your paper points out uh, criminal records of candidates and criminal origin of political funds. It was very, very interesting regarding electoral integrity, of course. Uh, my first question is about the links between uh, criminal justice and electoral justice. I just would like to know if there is a link in India uh, between the two systems, and therefore, if there is common sentences, that is to say, if sentences um, uh, uh, put in place in the criminal justice can be translated uh, uh, directly to electoral consequences. My second question concerns reforms of the judicial systems and electoral aspects. Do you follow them and what are the projects? And the same things for uh, political finance. Is there any uh, in initiative to enact new laws concerning regulation of campaign finance? You mentioned in uh, your presentation uh, petitions in 2024. So my question was uh, just quite simple. Can you explain us the full story of this project? And finally, Octanifia and Rafli, if I'm correct, your presentation describes a voting advice application. Um, there was by the way, uh, uh, there has been a, a significant increase uh, in uh, its use. It was quite impressive. So congratulations, I would say. Uh, but I'm curious to uh, know a little more about the users. 
uh, because generally, um, as it has been experienced in uh, different countries in Europe, these tools are used by very politicized people, people that are interested in politics, and therefore by those who would have voted without this tool. So can I have more uh, explanation about the more details about the, the user? I also would like to know how the application was circulating, uh, among which social networks, for instance. And finally, I have a question about the implementation of the tool. Uh, did you base your indicators on party manifestos? Just to organize a question related to the, the different proposition made by political parties. Or on the contrary, did you start from voters' concerns, voter perspectives, voter daily life, uh, to then try to match them with uh, uh, with um, political uh, pledges. So that's it. Here are some questions and remarks which uh, testify my interest uh, I had reading you and the curiosity I had about your research pro pro projects. And thank you again. Thank you very much.